Hey, big geeks! That's when Brad usually speaks. So contrary to popular belief, Brad and I don't actually live together. That would probably be too much. Uh, and self-isolation means that we have had to go our separate ways and do some lonely sofa sessions. But all is not lost. A, we hope it won't last for too long. And B, we've come up with a really cool way to keep our content moving and keep making interesting content, even though we can't leave the house and are just sort of scratching at the windows with a beer in our hands. So the idea we've come up with is hashtag beer stash. And what we're gonna be doing is every single week with some videos cut in between doing other stuff, we're going to be raiding our beer stashes. As you can imagine, over the years we've been doing this, six years, nearly seven years now, uh, our stash has got a little bit out of control. So I spent a lot of time yesterday going through my stash, cataloging it like an absolute nerd. Uh, and turns out that I've got about 90 bottles that I'm aging and probably another 30 or 40 that I shouldn't be aging but just happen to be doing so just through like not being an alcoholic. So having catalogued those, I've picked out what I have on my spreadsheet called the whale categories, uh, which is the stuff that's super rare, super exciting, and exactly the kind of stuff I've been saving for a special occasion. And to be honest, um, the end of the world is quite a good special occasion to choose. So I'm getting lots of those beers out and I'm gonna be cracking them and talking about them, kind of reviewing them, but we don't like doing straight up reviews on the channel. And we would love you guys to be doing the same. So if you've got a beer stash full of amazing stuff, you've been waiting to crack, waiting for an excuse, please do stick it on social, whether it's written, whether it's video, whatever it is, and just give us your view on it and we'll try to share it on these videos that we're doing. So for the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna be drinking my way through these four in the hope that four is enough to get us through the self-isolation. It might well not be, so we might have lots of these to come. And I'm gonna start with one that I have been meaning to open for a very, very, very long time. Confession, I've never tried this. In fact, I've never tried anything from Mills and I have been desperate to uh, ever since they started and since I heard about the stuff that they were doing, lots of spontaneous Lambic inspired beers, lots of working with wood. And I've heard so many great beer writers raving about how good these beers are. So I picked this up actually from the original batch. This is the Fox Bick, the first beer they ever released. And I never got around to it because I never found the occasion. Well, this is the occasion and I'm finally going to crack it. So Mills is actually just the side project of a, of a real ale brewer. And he's basically found himself a space where he is just brewing mixed fermentation, exciting Belgian inspired stuff. But mostly he's using British ingredients to do so. And for his first ever release, he actually teamed up uh, with Tom Oliver, who owns Oliver's Cider. He is an amazing cider maker, makes wonderful naturally fermented uh, ciders. And I think he's also the roadie for the Proclaimers, I believe. Um, so he's just an all-round awesome guy, and I've met him a couple of times and been absolutely awe-inspired by doing so. Haven't met Johnny Mills, but I'm about to meet his beer, and that's very exciting too. So Foxpick is a spontaneously fermented beer that's been aged or fermented by the Cider Lees in back... Cork. Reset. So Foxbick at its heart is a spontaneously fermented ale and cider hybrid. It owes a lot to Lambic, it owes a lot to cider, uh, and it owes a lot to British ingredients. So let's dig in to the cork, which I now know exists. Now this could go pop because it has been in my stash for a little while. Oh, it's absolutely perfect. A little bit of smoke on the opening. So the first step in making this beer was to make a turbid mash. Now this is what you do when you are making a lambic beer. In most modern beers, what you do is you add your grain to your warm water, you bring it up to the temperature that you need, and you let that sit for about an hour. A turbid mash, which is inspired by the lambic producers, still done by the lambic producers, you start off with a very low temperature, so some warmish water, some grain in there, and you slowly raise the temperature of it by taking a small amount out of the mash, superheating it and then putting it back in. So a little bit similar to decoction, uh, which is used in the making of Bohemian Pilsners. You also mash it for about 
four hours. So it's a long old process uh, and it used lots of wheat, perhaps some oats if you're not being particularly traditional, but other stuff. But the idea is to produce these long chains of sugar that normal yeast, Saccharomyces, won't actually eat. It leaves plenty of food for the bacteria and for Brett to work on further down the line. So you're enhancing these funky flavors that you're gonna get by using this turbid mash and getting these less fermentable sugars. So they made that turbid mash and then they put it apparently into like traditional real ale casks, transported it to Tom Oliver's place. And once it got there, they poured the beer or the wort out of the cask and into a bucket and then from a bucket into three different barrels. So plenty of oxygen would have got in there, but that's good because lots of fermentation is aerobic. And at that point, the oxidation is gonna be eaten up. It's not gonna affect the beer too much, but it's a pretty unusual convoluted process. But in these three barrels were cider leaves from Foxwell apples that have been used to make cider by Tom. And he picked these three barrels based on what he thought he got from those barrels. So there's an amazing blog that you can go to on the Mills website. There'll be a link in the descriptions box where you can see more details about the barrels, but he just wanted to get different flavors from them. Some are really funky, some were a little bit more uh, lactic and lemony, and some perhaps were a little bit more soft. And between those three, he thought he'd be able to get a beautiful blend. So we're getting uh, natural yeasts uh, from the Foxwell apples left over. We're getting natural yeast from the barrels that have already been used, that have been imbued in the wood. And then we're getting loads and loads of hard to ferment sugary strains, uh, sugary chains rather, uh, that these bugs can really, really get hold of. So let's see what kind of character we're gonna get from it. I mean, if you put that under my nose without me knowing what that was, I would 100% say that is a cider. Uh, it's got soft apple rind, it's got lots of soft bread, a little bit of lemony lactic character, like the kind of things you might expect from uh, a naturally fermented cider of, of, of decent quality. In terms of grain character, in terms of lambic character, that bread's there and there's a tiny, tiny bit of oak tannin. Man, this is a beer I could smell for days and be an utter nerd about it. Recently, we got accused of being beer snobs. Um, you're right, yeah. It smells incredible, like really delicious, light, scrumpy cider. Oh, that's so good. So obviously it's gonna have changed hugely in character. Um, so it was in those barrels for eight months, it was in bottle for eight months, and then I've aged it for a further, um, nearly two years, I think. It's lost none of its fresh apple character. It's really, really juicy. Loads of tannins just popping on the side of my tongue and coating with like that soft red wine kind of tannic um, powderiness that just makes you want to salivate. Um, lots and lots of gorgeous, uh, bretty, zesty, um, sherbety things popping as well. Um, it, it, it's still on my tongue, the flavor is still there. I'm not feeling like I need another sip because it's all still there. And it's tasting like a really, really dry cider. But there's just this hint of juice at the end that doesn't feel like it should be there because it feels like it's all fermented dry. It's a, it's a slightly strange and rather, um, I was gonna say discombobulating. That's very much a Brad word, I'm, 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 he's here in spirit. I put this down as a whale because now at this point, some Mills beers are being sold on the secondary market for hundreds and hundreds of pounds because there's not many of them about. Um, and people are really interested, A, to know what, you know, truly brilliant British mixed fermentation stuff tastes like, but B, Tom Oliver carries his own cachet as well. So these, this beer in particular, I think is very sought after. And as I always have to remind myself when I have a really whale-like beer, that's not why the brewery has made that. Nobody intentionally goes out there to make a beer that's gonna sell for hundreds of pounds on the secondary market. They're just making the best beers they can. And this one, with its low ABV as well, is I think it's less than 5%, probably even still at this point. They're not trying to make the kind of beer that you should be uh, queuing up for. They're not trying to make the kind of beer that they want traded. They're trying to make something that's delicious for a bottle and you'll want another bottle. <laughs> Whether there's another bottle there or not is where that kind of uh, demand begins to be created. So. Is this blowing my palate? Is this blowing my mind? Um, yeah, a little bit, but not to the extent that I think we always think we're gonna get with a whale, and I'm kind of glad of that. It's a 
cider ale hybrid and it is perfectly balanced with loads and loads of apple character probably more apple character than there is beer character so it should almost be under the oliver umbrella to some extent uh, but a lot of work goes into a turbid mash it's a hell of a lot of work and i think has a lot to do with the fact that this beer's come out so incredibly dry so everything's been fermented out but also so incredibly complex even in its even in its body which can be a bit thin after that amount of fermentation and if any of you guys have sat on that, I don't know what it was like when it was fresh, which is always the problem with only buying one bottle, but it is stunning right now. Uh, so long as you don't treat it like a whale, so long as you just go, I'm going to sit here for half an hour and I'm going to see that away. So absolutely in love with that. It reminds me of being... Like in my early 20s, I went to university in Devon, like lying in the fields, drinking scrumpy cider. I would not have appreciated that for the balance and the beauty uh, that it has. Uh, I'd have been drinking some pretty gnarly ciders, but there's just something really nostalgic about having those flavours again. And it's really reassuring to have a bottle like this that won't uh, make you feel very sore very, very quickly. Um, it's a beautifully made beer. I'd love to know what's in your hashtag beer stash. So please do put any beers that you try online as soon as you can, and we'll put them into the videos for next week. We'll talk about them in our podcast, which if you don't know, we have a podcast every Friday called Friday 5 p.m., which you can find in the descriptions box below as well. And we'll be talking about those, reading out some of the best beer stash comments that we get so get posting those get cracking those beers because this is a special occasion the end of the world is the ultimate occasion for you to be drinking the beers that you've never quite found an excuse to drink uh, stay safe wash those hands and if you see him say hi to brad for me